think we'll get started this afternoon. Welcome to the winter quarter. Welcome to the winter quarter uh, Friday seminar series. I'm delighted to kick it off with Darren Gurgel. We were just comparing notes. We've known each other for 15 years. That's a big number. He was nine at the time. <laughs> he was getting his master's degree at the University of Michigan School of Information, and he was in the lab with Gary and me doing some early experiments uh, on trust. But Darren is a man of many talents. Uh, his undergraduate degrees are in psychology and art. And the art part is sculpture and printmaking. Printmaking comes in handy, right? Um, but <clears throat> he went from that to the master's at, in human computer interaction at the School of Information at Michigan. His PhD is from Carnegie Mellon from the Human Computer Interaction Institute. Uh, but he does, he's a guy who goes after many things. And if he needs to learn something, he does. And then he becomes an expert in that. So he has done eye tracking in collaboration. So it means if your head can move, and eye tracking is very difficult in that set situation. Um, medical school studying clinical depression, uh, natural language processing, you're gonna hear some of that today. Trust development, visualizations, lots of things about different kinds of displays, and romantic conflict. <laughs> Man of many talents. Um, <laughs> I, uh, he, very early in HCI, wrote a seminal textbook, Usability on the Web, with Tom Brink and? Scott Wood. Scott Wood, oh, I remember Scott, okay. That's great. Uh, later, when I was editing a book about the different methods in human-computer interaction called Ways of Knowing in HCI, I went to Darren to write the chapter on experiments. So experimental design and how you run experiments and analyze them, it's a really excellent chapter in this book. So that was Darren. Uh, today, he's gonna talk about the Wikipedia <coughs> language gap. Uh, we look forward to it. Let's welcome Darren. Well, thank you for the lovely introduction, and uh, thank you for giving me an excuse to get out of Chicago uh, in the middle of January. That, that's uh, lovely. Welcome to Irvine, where it rained this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the work I'm going to present on today really stems from a larger project in my lab uh, that has as its goal to understand and mine diversity information from user-generated content repositories, uh, and then to leverage this knowledge to develop new types of technologies. And so for today's talk, I want to focus on uh, work we've done over the past, I guess, five plus years now, um, where we're examining the role that language and language-based communities play on Wikipedia content diversity. So I think whether we'd like to admit it or not, uh, Wikipedia is one of the most important uh, information resources of our time. And I don't mean this as a scholarly resource. You know, I'm not, I'm not telling graduate students to go to Wikipedia to do all their, their literature reviews and background. Um, but I mean this much more as, uh, as a resource and a first place to go for people to learn about something new, a new subject, a new topic, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as a result of this, we've seen a great deal of literature uh, and scholarly literature that's, that's examined Wikipedia, right? An economist um, a decade or two ago probably would have told you this is not possible, like people just to put in their own time and not get paid for it and to produce an artifact of this quality and this scale, I think would have been uh, something they, would, they wouldn't have been able to expect. And so it's, it's garnered a lot of scholarship and a lot of uh, attention in the literature. Um, we've studied things like the coordination and collaboration processes that take place among the editor editors and um, people editing Wikipedia uh, and people contributing to it. We've studied things like participation and contribution, so who contributes to it, uh, how can we get them to give better contributions, higher quality, um, better kinds of comments that they're adding to the, the encyclopedia. Uh, a lot of studies of things like topical coverage and contribution biases. So who's contributing? Um, is it just sort of 25 to 35 year olds that are writing about Star Trek? Or are we getting good coverage across all of the topics that kind of uh, we would want to know and have an encyclopedic coverage of? Um, and then the second thing to, to think about here is that Wikipedia data structures have also been incredibly important as what I would call the brains of a lot of uh, artificial intelligence and natural language processing systems. So we think about things like uh, search, and, um, search and retrieval systems, text categorization, um, computing things like what we call semantic relatedness, which is how related is one entity to another. Right? The basis of these computations oftentimes are being drawn from, from Wikipedia. And one of the reasons is it gives us access to a lot of kind of pop culture information, a lot of stuff that was hard to encode into sort of traditional AI databases. So we know that Barack Obama has a place in Hyde Park in Chicago, and that Chicago also hosted Britney Spears, and Britney Spears likes hot dogs, and vice, you know, all of this information that's really hard to accrue, we now have a computational basis for it, and we can use it in a lot of natural language and AI systems. 
That said, the vast majority of this research has focused almost exclusively on the English Wikipedia. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yet there's over 280 active uh, Wikipedia language editions right now. Uh, and I and argue that the sort of implicit and, and problematic assumption of all of that prior work, some of which is my own, uh, is that people in different parts of the world, speaking different languages, they have access to the same information, participate and coordinate in similar ways, uh, and they exhibit similar cover coverage biases. Right? So we're focusing exclusively on English, and we're, we're sort of saying that we think this generalizes everywhere else without sort of empirically investigating that. Um, furthermore, I think this is also an important thing for us to assess and to think about, because as we start to think about the global nature of knowledge repositories like Wikipedia, there's several things I, I, I want to urge us to think critically about. One is equitable information access. Language and access to language is a potential barrier. So if people don't speak a certain language and they can't have access to that information, this can drive a divide in the information and that's available to them and the, the, what they can learn from it. Um, the second thing is I think we want to think critically about retaining diverse perspectives and providing truly what I would call global coverage in a knowledge representation system like Wikipedia. And then finally, there's been a lot of attention to this lately, this notion of algorithmic biases. Uh, and the role that they play in the information that, that's being structured, its representation, and ultimately its consumption. So a lot of work is focused on what, what are the sort of hidden or latent elements of uh, algorithms, how does that influence the information that's represented, if that's done in ways, for instance, personalization. We get exposure to things we already know, for instance, news articles. We see the same type of news, we see the same bent, and this selective exposure can influence or have downstream effects on what people are getting exposed to and what they're learning. Okay. But to address this um, and to begin to sort of understand some of these things, um, as we got into this project, we realized that we need new tools, we need new perspectives, and we need new methods to be able to tackle these problems. So the uh, talk that I want to go over today is really going to cover three things. Um, in the first part, I want to develop a new study, uh, new ways and new techniques to study content diversity and cover it across language editions in Wikipedia. Um, in the second part of the talk, I want to demonstrate what the effect potential coverage biases and what, what is being talked about, what's being covered in these Wikipedia editions, how that can influence end user technologies. Uh, and in the third part, I want to talk about developing what I call a new class of technologies that make use of this diversity of information and this representation uh, in new ways. So Gerhard Fischer talks about a couple of things here. Uh, in, this, in these first two, he's, he would classify this as describing and discovering how things are. And the third part of this talk, I want to talk about how things can be. Right, so we're, we're bas basically doing the empirical investigation to demonstrate what's happening and then um, giving us a, a direction or a way to sort of move forward. Okay? So we started this uh, about, like I said, over, a little over five years ago now, um, and we thought it was a really simple question that I wanted to answer. And I was sitting around with our graduate students, it was over the summer, and we thought, to what extent is there diversity in the content that's represented across these Wikipedia language editions? I thought it would be a two or three month project. It turns out five years later, we're still trying to answer the question in some ways, and we're still working on it. So uh, be warned, graduate students. Um, one, uh, I'm going to use a device to kind of talk, as I go through this talk, to, to simplify the argument I want to make. But this is a bit of a false dichotomy. So I know with cultural anthropologists in the audience, um, this might not be the best way to go about it. But, but hopefully you can follow along with me, and, um, and it'll sort of make sense as we tie it together. Um, but there's really two perspectives you could have on diversity. The first is what I'm going to call a global co consensus perspective. And this is the idea that the, each language's encyclopedic world knowledge should cover roughly the same concepts. Uh, it should do so in a pretty similar way. Um, and there's an implicit assumption here in a lot of existing systems. So things like Microsoft Research has something called Wikibasha. And what that does is it allows you to pull up a page in one language, and it'll translate it into a page in another language. And then you can sort of re readjust some of the graphics and, and publish it to that new language. Um, there's an approach called information arbitrage from the University of Washington and, and University of Michigan, where they're sort of automatically moving information from one page to another. Uh, and wholesale translation systems that want to just duplicate all the information, say, in the German Wikipedia into the English Wikipedia. So all of these perspectives take what I would call this global consensus perspective. And in fact, it's a little bit more than that. A lot of people, particularly in the more computer science side of the world, um, would argue that large differences between languages are essentially bugs that need to be fixed, or they're problems in that representation that need to be dealt with. right? Um, or even just simply ignored, we'll say, OK, well, in this language, it's different, so we're just going to act like that doesn't matter. 
Um, that should be contrasted then with this, what I'm going to call global diversity perspective. Uh, and I think this is much more consistent with social scientific positions where we would consider cultural knowledge uh, representation and production. And it assumes that there's major differences across these language editions and that these differences are meaningful and important. Right? So these are kind of two extremes we could take when we're thinking about what degree of content diversity is there in these different um, repositories. So a little bit of a description before I get started of some of the terminology I want to use. So if we think about this, these are Wikipedia pages. This is chocolate in Swedish and chocolate in English, I believe, or I may have them backwards. Um, I'm going to talk about concepts, which is essentially the article topic itself. So does this concept exist in a language? Right? When I say that, that means does the article exist in this language or not? But we can also have another form of diversity. I'm going to call this subconcept diversity. And this is the article body. So this is what's actually being written about chocolate in these two different cases. Right? So I'm going to, we're going to do some studies and we're going to look at both concept diversity, does it exist in the language editions or not, and subconcept diversity. If it exists in, in multiple languages, is it being talked about or written about in the same way? And we need to develop some techniques then to be able to assess this kind of empirically. So the first study is going to be concept level diversity. And we start uh, in this work, um, and these were data from about 2012. Uh, we were working with a parallel Wikipedia corpora of 25 different language editions. Um, we had about 18 million articles and around 1 billion links. So this was around 280 gigabytes of raw data that we were processing. English was the largest uh, repository we used. There were around 4 million articles and almost 300 million links. Hebrew was the smallest, uh, and there was only 142,000 articles and 10 million links that we were processing. So we're going to simultaneously work with um, these 25 different language editions. And again, um, a, rather, a rather large corpus uh, of over a billion uh, links that we're kind of processing. So what we need to do when we do this work is we need to be able to go from something like this page and convert it into what I would call a universal concept. Uh, or an abstracted representation uh, of that page. So this is what we would know as chocolate. We're going to call this is going to be a concept. It's going to have an ID 4042. It'll become clear why we have to do this when we start to get to this sort of multilingual uh, investigation. But we want to be able to get from that to eventually this, what we call a universal concept. This is what we would know in English as chocolate, right? Or in French as, as chocolat. Um, so it's a concept 4042, and it is attached to or kind of associated with a number of different languages. And so this representation is essentially the data structure that we want to get to in order to enable the analysis we're going to do. Okay. So if you think about how do we do this, Wikipedia has uh, an interesting thing, what are called interlanguage links. So if you go to a Wikipedia page and you look on the left-hand side, there will be links to a bunch of different languages that exist down that left-hand side. So if we think of Wikipedia as being a big graph, in English, we have all of the graph structure. We'd also have a parallel graph in, in French, in German, in Swedish, in Japanese. <coughs> Interlanguage links tie across those. So they tell you that the, the page bread in English is the same as this other page in German. Right? So it's essentially a way to sort of allow us to parallelize at some level these different, uh, these different graphs that we're going to get across languages. So we make use of interlanguage links um, in order to build this multilingual uh, data structure. So here's an, a toy example, and this is not actually what happens with chocolate. Chocolate's actually a universal construct, thank goodness, <laughs> right? We would we'd wonder what's wrong with the world if that wasn't the case. But just as a toy example, you can see we have the chocolate page in Danish, in English, in Hebrew, and Spanish. We have interlang interlanguage links that are linking between these, uh, and it gives us this universal or sort of multilingual concept that we're capturing. But you'll notice something here, and again, this is just an example. There's no link between English and Spanish. Um, this is what we call a missing link problem. Um, but by using this structure, by, if we were looking at this pairwise, we wouldn't have this connection. But by looking at it in a hyperlingual sense, we actually can sort of infer that there should be a connection uh, across these two languages. So we can build our concept space uh, by doing this. Okay? So there's, there were two challenges that we had to overcome when we were trying to develop this multilingual corpus. Um, the first was this missing link challenge that I just mentioned. And this has helped by the fact that we're attacking multiple languages at once. Right? We can solve for those missing links. Uh, and we actually demonstrate that we get about 96% of the links that are detected in um, probably the best currently published uh, data set that's that looks for missing links in the Wikipedia data structures. Um, the second thing, though, is that the side effect of us solving for the missing link problem is we create another problem, which we call a conceptual drift problem. 
So we can think of conceptual drift. Uh, it really it stems from this well-known finding in, in cognitive science that the boundaries of concepts tend to vary across <laughs> language-defined communities. Right? So the boundaries of a certain concept are, are fuzzy as you go from one language to another. They're not sort of the same as you're, as you're moving around. And you can think of this as, as basically a semantic equivalent of what happens in the children's game known as telephone. Right? So everyone knows telephone. So if I was to go over to Matt Beats and I was to whisper, you know, Irvine is very sunny. And then he would whisper and we'd go all the way through the crowd. We'd come back. By the time we got to Judy, Judy would um, tell me what she heard. And she would say, you know, it's a fine hair or bunny. Right? So you have this sort of movement in the word space that's happening as you're sort of uh, moving through. And we get a similar thing happen, happening kind of semantically uh, when we're actually assessing uh, these, these multi, taking this multilingual approach um, to creating con concepts. So here's an example of how this actually plays out. We have the river page in English. It links to the river page in German. But the German page doesn't agree with that necessarily. And its link back to English comes to this canal page. Okay. So we're getting this, this movement in the concept space. This gets even worse because we go from Canal in English to the French Wikipedia. Uh, French Wikipedia then links to something else called Canyon. And when this sort of runs amok, we end up with a concept that for, initially for river in English includes rain gutter and trench warfare. Right? So clearly we're having a problem by, by using all of the links in all these languages. We're sort of over capturing the concept size that we want. So we need a way to deal with that. Um, so we've written a, a paper on this, and we have an algorithm we call conceptual line, which has two parameters that help us to essentially prune these concepts to what are, are kind of more we we'll call high clarity uh, concepts. We have a, a parameter called um, max edges, which limits the number of edges that we allow from a given language um, that can point to the same article in another language. And we have a second parameter called min langs, where we just require a certain percentage of the languages to agree on an edge in order for it to remain. And this we can actually set pretty low. If we just set this at two, um, we tend to get rid of a lot of these the sort of egregious <laughs> problems. So what this is really allows us to do is to sort of prune this, this graph, prune this uh, tree a little bit, um, so that we're getting kind of a, a clearer uh, concept in a multilingual sense. Okay? So this was a technique we developed that allowed us then to go from Wikipedia pages to get to these universal constructs that we need so that we can then begin to sort of ask this initial question, how much diversity exists across these language editions in the concepts that are being talked about and written about, okay? So after we parsed 25 database dumps from 25 different da database languages, we aligned 11 million pages uh, to their corresponding concepts. Um, what did we find? Well, we found that the archetypal concept didn't look anything like chocolate. Right? And in fact, it looked a lot more like this. So this is a single language concept. It's Rogenmark. It's a, a market district in Munster, Germany. Right? And this was an, an example of a single language concept that we saw. Uh, this is Saki Hall Street. For those of you in, familiar with Glasgow or the Glaswegian area, this is one of the main thoroughfares in, in, in Scotland. Um, Hillbilly Jedi. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay, that says something. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is an album released by Big and Rich, which are pretty popular, actually. Uh, it was like number four on the singles list and number 25 on the Billboard list. Uh, it's a country music duo, um, but again, a regional music in some ways. And so it's, it's limited. It only appears in the English, uh, in the English uh, encyclopedia or Wikipedia. Um, anybody know who this is? Any guesses? He hangs out. Outside the White House, isn't he? Hangs outside the White House? No, but I know who you're talking about. It's close. Gloria probably has the best chance of anyone here to answer this, but um, it's a stretch, I'm guessing. Anybody want to venture a guess? No. This is Dieter Grosch. He's a Brandenburg Parliament member uh, in oh, Germany. Yeah. <laughs> but I also give partial credit if you said Gandalf. <laughs> So when we look across the distribution of these languages, um, and we, we look at the number of concepts, uh, as I said, the vast majority of these concepts are single language concepts. So um, they look more like this market district in Germany. We get a really just a, an enormous amount of single language constructs across these language editions. So what this is telling us is that across these language editions, there's a lot of unique information that exists. Right? And in fact, less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of all the concepts that we look at exist in all 25 languages. Right, so only a very small number 
relatively speaking, of those exist in this in all 25 language editions that we investigated. And regardless of how we cut the data, we see pretty similar patterns, right? So if we just look at the smallest three Wikipedias, we see that about 86% of the concepts are single language and 5% exist in all three. If we look at the largest three Wikipedias, which were, um, I believe, English, uh, German, and French at the time, uh, would be about 80% of the concepts were single language and only 8% existed in all three. So we're not seeing a whole lot of kind of coverage across these different language editions. Um, one challenge you might raise to this is you could say, okay, well, if we go back to this chart, there's a lot that's unique here, but English is so large, it's three times the, the, next, the size of the next Wikipedia, which is German, um, three to four times usually. And so maybe all this unique stuff is just stuff that's only in English. Right? We refer to that as the, um, the English as superset corollary, and it would look something like this. We would think English has four million articles, it covers everything that's in the German, but it still has all these unique articles out there, and that there is one of the things that's driving this. But we actually see when we sort of do a pairwise analysis across all the language editions, that's not the case, right? So actually around 48% of the German concepts uh, are not in English. So we're seeing still a great deal of uniqueness even if we look at sort of compared to the largest uh, Wikipedia. Similarly with French and German, about 33 to 36% of the concepts um, are covered. So only, only about 33 to 36% of the concepts are covered in one another, right? So in that overlap set. Yeah, Gary. It seems like a, like a slightly odd definition of concept because chocolate seems like a concept. The name of a street in Germany doesn't seem like a concept in the same sense. Yes. And so is there any way of differentiating the things that are shared by lots of languages from the things that are more unique and they have some interesting properties? Um, it's, that's a really good question. And so I think, I think there's a challenge with... I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. So, so Gary was asking that basically it seems like there's a difference between uh, things that we're calling concepts, right, where we say chocolate, which is kind of clearly a concept, but Saki Hall Street is it's not necessarily a concept in the same way. And, and I think one of the challenges is, is, you know, article topic is really what we're looking at. A lot of uh, natural language processing folks have referred to these as kind of concepts in the way that they develop them. But I think from more of a cognitive science perspective, Concept is probably not the term to really be to be using here, but in some of the work that we've been doing recently, we've been trying to look at where is the overlap and, and what kinds of things are happening, and we can use actually the Wikipedia category structure to, to get at some of that. Um, and it's actually not that we haven't seen a whole lot of patterns yet, but that's work that we're still kind of working on. Okay, so um, I think just generally we would say like this this provides not much support for this global consensus, so that everything is sort of similar has been represented in the same way, uh, and much more support for this notion of kind of global diversity. But that said, there's still a lot of concepts that did exist. It's a really big corpus, right? There's still a lot of concepts that still existed uh, in all 25 language editions that we looked at. Here's a selection of some of them. They may or may not make you proud of, <laughs> of our global culture. Um, we have things like, you know, Nobel and Einstein, which I think we can all say, oh, that's, that's pretty great. Um, we also have like every Star Trek character, uh, every um, football player, by that I mean soccer player, uh, that kind of exists on any, any national team, um, and you know, other things. Sarah Palin, for instance, um, is an example of a global concept that we had. But just the fact that we have articles of these same people or these same <coughs> kind of entities doesn't mean that they're being written about in the same way. So let's take Sarah Palin as, Palin as an example. The English Wikipedia might say very different things than the French Wikipedia, might say very different things than the Hebrew Wikipedia, Japanese Wikipedia, and so on and so forth. So in the second study, what we want to do is come up with a way to investigate what we call sub-concept diversity. So the, what's being written about these different, these different topics, these different articles. Okay. So for this, we take a corpus of 217,000 of these same concept page pairs, uh, and they're drawn from this list of global concepts. So these are concepts that existed in all 25 languages, and we want, a degree, uh, we want to determine the average degree of overlap that exists at the page level. So one of the ways we do this is that we build on a technique that was initially developed by Adafra and Dereich. Uh, where we use the links on the page as a heuristic representation of the content. Okay? So if we're going through the chocolate page in English, we can think about all of these links, we pull them out, and this is a really nice way to do sort of a, a cheap and dirty fast version of uh, essentially topical coverage on a page. So if we do that, we see on the chocolate page a bunch of things that are linked to are Mexico, Mesoamerica, Aztec, 
cocoa butter, white chocolate, eggs, Easter, Africa. This gives a nice heuristic uh, summary of the content that's being talked about on the page. And one of the reasons this works really well on Wikipedia is because it is so structured and so curated, and these are other pages that have to be sort of meaningful in order to be part of this corpus, uh, that it gives us a good, a good representation. So once we do that, we convert these into our universal IDs. Remember those from the earlier slides, so we're thinking about English uh, version of chocolate, and we have all these numbers. We can then do this across language editions, and we can now begin to calculate overlap across these. So we're going to use something called an overlap coefficient. Um, if you speak set, then this is pretty easy. Uh, it can translate, so it's the size of the intersection of the link sets over the size of the smaller link set. So we're basically trying to capture the amount of overlap from the, of the, the amount of the smaller page that's represented on the larger page. Okay? So just to walk you through an example of how this works, we have the chocolate page in English and say the chocolate page in Hebrew. Hebrew has four things that it's talking about, right, that we pick up. So we see that we have four of those elements and all four of them are captured on the English page. Um, that would give us an overlap of four and the size of the smaller link set is four, so we have an overlap coefficient of one. Right? This would basically say that 100% of the things talked about on the small page are also talked about on the large page. Okay. If we did this with Spanish, and Spanish picked up a couple of concepts that were similar to English, we would have two, but we'd have the, sm the smaller set is a total of six, so this would give us an overlap coefficient of 0.33, telling us that about 33% of the things that were talked about on the Spanish page were also talked about on the larger English page. Okay. So the overlap coefficient just gives us a way to sort of put in terms, kind of in quantitative terms, the smaller page relative to the larger page. Yep? Why do you pick the smaller page as the denominator? Yeah, it's, um, I think one of the reasons we did it was because we wanted to have 100% as kind of a, a basis for it. We can actually pick as the denominator a number of things. We could do the proportion of the, of the smaller that's in the proportion to the larger one as well, too. Yeah. Um, so there's not, I know there wasn't a, major reason for it, we actually had done it both ways, but we think this is sort of a more intuitive uh, sense in some ways, especially when we look at this distribution. So this is the distribution of what we get. It's the percentage of the shortage, the shorter pages links covered by the longer pages links. And the mean overlap coefficient here is 0.41. So what this means is that on average, the shorter of any two Wikipedia pages uh, on the same concept um, have about 59% of the links and the things they're talking about are not appearing on the larger page. Right? So almost 60% of that content that's being represented on the smaller pages is, is, doesn't look to be consistent with what's on the larger pages. Okay? So in other words, what's being written about these two pages seems to be pretty different. So again, I think here we have support for this notion of this global diversity uh, uh, hypothesis, especially at the sub-concept level, so what's being kind of written about. So the natural next question, at least for us, was what's driving some of this? And why is this, why is this happening? Why are we seeing some of these differences? What accounts for the subconcept diversity? And so in this third study, what we did was we wanted to examine what the source of the subconcept diversity might be and see the degree to which um, particular languages and those cultures that are associated with those languages center around regional objects uh, of interest. So I really like this picture from The New Yorker. I don't know if you've seen this before, but this is The New Yorker's view of the world. And so you have essentially the general idea is that things that are close to you, this is also in geography known as Tobler's First Law, things that are close are more important than things that are far away. Um, this is The New Yorker's view of the world. They have 9th Avenue, 10th Avenue, all of the sort of local buildings, and then they have the Hudson River, and they have this like sliver of, probably they would describe this maybe sludge, uh, that's Jersey. Um, and then as you move up, you have Chicago, Kansas City, uh, Las Vegas, kind of California, Pacific Ocean, uh, Russia, China, Japan. Right? So as things get further and further away, they have to be more salient in order to sort of be thought about. And so this, we refer to this idea as self-focus. It's this idea that we want and will have more information locally situated around us, spatially situated around us. So to do this analysis, we make use of a number of geography techniques, uh, and we work on a subset of the Wikipedia data that has uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, latitude and longitude uh, encoded in it. So we have spatial entities, and there's a great deal of spatial entities in the, in the Wikipedias, uh, and these are actually a very well kind of curated set of data uh, in Wikipedia. So this is an example of an uh, administrative district or, or kind of a county region, and it gives you kind of coordinates of, of where that's at latitude and longitude-wise. Um, we did this for around 9 million 
geotag articles. Um, we had 217 million links, and we looked across 15 Wikipedia pages, uh, language editions. And so each of these purple dots is basically a spatial location of one of the pages that we were looking at. So you see we get pretty good kind of coverage and maps pretty closely to uh, population. So we need a technique to begin to assess this, and we're going to use something that in geography is referred to as a spatial in-degree sum. Uh, what a spatial in-degree sum allows you to do, you can think of this um, as essentially a very simple measure of geographic network centrality. So if you're familiar with network statistics, we have this notion of centrality. Think about centrality, which is like a page that's more important, and then laying that out on some spatial configuration. So here, let's take an example. We're going to use spatial in-degree sums. We have a region that we know as Poland. We have a number of uh, spatial entities that reside within this geographic region. So Szczecin and Warsaw are just two example cities. And then we will calculate the in-degree sum by the number of other pages that mention or link to these particular entities. So what this gives us is a way to sort of take the weight of everything that's written about in the Wikipedia around a spe specific spatial region. Okay? So we can sort of sum this up for Poland, and we get an in-degree sum of eight. Uh, and this is according to the Polish Wikipedia. Right, so this would basically say all of the world's information in Poland, uh, or all of the world's information is related to entities within Poland at some measure, and this measure is going to be eight. We could also do this for the English Wikipedia, although we might see here that there's less things that link to spatial entities within the Polish region, and we would get a lower in-degree sum. Okay, so that's kind of the basis of how the calculation is going to work. If we think to these general hypotheses, this global consensus hypothesis, if that's true, if everything is sort of the same across Wikipedias, we'd expect that the in-degree sums would have roughly the same distribution uh, in every Wikipedia. If it's the global diversity that we're seeing, we would expect that each language's Wikipedia uh, should have higher in-degree sums in the countries where that language is prominent. Right? So one way to think about this is that the Wikipedias will demonstrate greater focus where that language's culture and population uh, primarily exist. And we get Examples, we can obviously, this is just a subset of things, but here you can see um, as we look across, this is the German Wikipedia. So what this is basically saying is that entities in Germany are almost seven times more likely to be written about or talked about in the German Wikipedia than any entities in the US. Right? So another way to think about this is that Germany, according to the German Wikipedia, Germany and objects in it are seven times uh, greater than any, any other sort of country in the world. So they're seven times more important. Finnish, you see a similar thing, right? Almost twice as much uh, spatial in-degree sum on entities within Finland in the Finnish Wikipedia, and Japan is 450,000 to the next closest, which is Italy, which is around 70,000. So we're seeing a great deal of information that's accruing on these geographic regions or these spatial regions that are associated with the languages that are being represented. Um, there's some better ways, I think, to, to represent this. So we have some kind of maps. This is the time for you guys to have a geography quiz. For those of you close, you can read the labels, don't cheat. For those of you far away, I want to know what country this is. And someone in the back? The, the, the red one? The, yeah, I'm sorry, the brightest red one. So this is the greatest amount of in degree. Poland. Poland, OK, good, you pass. This is Poland on the world scale. Right? We can see that it's accruing much, much more information than anywhere else. What Wikipedia is this? Second question, uh, which one is this? US, is it the US Wikipedia? How about English? And we can apologize to Durish if he was here because uh, it's more on the US than it is in England or, or Scotland potentially. Right? But that also points out one of the challenges that I'm gonna talk about, which is the degree to which language maps directly to geographic regions and geographic entities. Okay? And this is the Japanese Wikipedia. Right? So we can see as we do this where the locations that are, are kind of important. You guys will like this one. This is looking at the English Wikipedia. We can use this same approach at any geographic scale, which is really nice. So we can define different boundaries. We can do administrative districts. We can make up arbitrary shapes. And we can look for the amount of information that's accruing within that region. So if we look at the English Wikipedia, and we compare it to a map of the US states and uh, provinces of Canada, um, we can see which areas are, are sort of the most represented. Right? And we see California is pretty popular. New York uh, is there um, in Canada. We have Ontario. Um, look what happens if we switch to the French Wikipedia. <laughs> 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 English, French. Yeah, so 
so the French Wikipedia, like California, is just universally important. <laughs> is what you're getting from this, right? Um, but what's this? What's going on up here? <laughs> Quebec, right? The primarily French-speaking region of Canada. So we, suddenly that becomes much more important than the English Wikipedia, uh, than it is represented in the English Wikipedia. So that's a nice technique, I think, that allows us to sort of see where some of this, these differences in diversity are, are actually coming from. And, and so we see that self-focus is one of probably many systemic biases that exist across these Wikipedia language editions. Um, people tend to orient knowledge around themselves. And I think that's, it's not groundbreaking. We would expect that. The, the way we learn is we associate to things that we know. And so the best encyclopedias should actually relate to objects and entities that we know. So if we, take, if we look at something, for instance, like the Empire State Building, and we look at it in English, it talks about English architects. It talks about buildings such as the Willis Tower, formerly the Sears Tower in Chicago, that are similar in size. If we look at the Empire State Building in the French Wikipedia, they relate it to Parisian and French architects that had an influence on the style. They talk about its height relative to the Eiffel Tower, and so on and so forth. So they're sort of regionally and locally contextualizing that information relative to the entity that's being described. Okay. So the second thing I want to do um, is demonstrate, and that clock is right at the back, is that correct? Ish? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, what these coverage biases, the influence they can have on these end user technologies. So you notice, when I, when I, or as I mentioned at the beginning, I said, you know, one thing is to assess this, the second is to see what impact it can have on technologies. So um, quickly here I'll go over um, a study, and we've done a number of different ones, I'm just going to present on one. Um, but one of the questions we wanted to know is, can this diversity influence our end user technologies? So one of the things you get with, with Wikipedia is these data structures are being used in these AI and NLP uh, systems. Uh, they process the data, they give you some output on the basis of that. What we want to do is get back to this idea of global consensus versus global hypothesis. The global consensus would say, regardless of the data that we feed us into a system, we should get similar outputs. Right? So if we're trying to calculate relatedness or something like that, it should be basically the same. The global diversity perspective would hold that the data that we input into the system should give us a very different output if it contains those biases that we're talking about that are represented in that data. So our goals here were really to sort of demonstrate the effect that this global diversity has on technologies that use single language editions as their source of knowledge. And most of these technologies use a single language, and the vast majority of those technologies use English. And even if they're going to be doing something for, a, for another language, they start with English because it's the largest, and they translate after the fact. So they're translating at the output stage, which means they've the embedded these biases into the data, even though they're being represented in a local language. Okay, so I think that, that's a concern or a problem we need to be aware about. So the, one of the test technology that we're using here is something called explicit semantic analysis, a uh, very highly cited LP paper by Grigolovich and Markovich. Uh, and semantic relatedness is basically just how related are two things. So we can imagine bread and peanut butter. And we can say on a, zero, a scale of 0 to 1, how related are those? Right? It's a nice example because in the US here, um, we have this notion of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So there should be some amount of sort of relationship between the two. But if you ask you know, somebody in Europe about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, it's, it's not something that they're willing to really sort of enter into conversation about. Right? So we might expect a kind of a lower uh, relationship between the two. Um, to put this more in, in something of a local context, we might ask something like, how does UCI relate to Planet of the Apes, right? So local knowledge would probably give you a higher uh, ratio there than you would get somewhere else. So we're going to take different uh, data to feed into this system, and we're going to look at concept pairs and the relatedness metric, semantic relatedness scores we get out of them. So we'll seed it with English, we'll seed it with German, we'll seed it with Spanish. We have the same technology, same computation, same algorithms running, uh, and we're going to look at the output. And the question we want to know is, Will our results, when we look at these pairings from bread and peanut butter in English, be different from the score we get in German and Spanish and so on and so forth? And we're just going to use kind of the correlation in these, in these scores to, to look at that. So we have, uh, in this study, just 10 different language pairs and 2,000 concept pairs that we put into the system. And we're going to compare English to French, German to French, and so on and so forth. Right? We want to compare the correlation of the outcome of all of these different uh, groupings. And what we see is we end up with, uh, with an R of 0.18. Right? So what this tells us when we do this is that the average pairwise uh, explicit semantic analysis correlation uh, output that we get across the languages um, is, is really quite low. Right? I mean, one would basically say they're exactly the same. 
zero is no correlation. We're down here at 0.18 on kind of average. And the, even by looking at the distribution, you can see there's not that much that's pushing uh, much past that. Okay. So if we're to think about this back in sort of the initial context I laid out, we're going to see if we see these with different data sets, different user-generated content, we get very different outcomes. Even though in theory, a lot of people would say these are supposed to be parallel corpora, these are supposed to be representing the world's knowledge. Jimmy Wales would like to say that this is all, should all be sort of universal knowledge that we've come to kind of agree upon. And we're not seeing that uh, at all. So this can be a serious concern, I think, for a number of existing Wikipedia-based technologies. So things like semantic related calculations, information retrieval systems, topic detection and clustering, a lot of different techniques that rely on these data structures uh, can have some problems. Um, you get different things, like if you search for World War II, the top 10 ranked entities that come back will be very different if you search in the English Wikipedia versus the German. For instance, in the German, you see um, carpet bombing becomes in the top five results uh, relative to World War II, and it's much further down in the English. And that's because carpet uh, bombing was basically the atrocity committed against the German people in World War II. And so it is much more highly ranked as a result of the data being talked about and written about in the Wikipedia. But I don't want to say that this is all bad. I actually think this diversity is a good thing, and it's useful, and it's meaningful, uh, and it is, is good information for us to have. Um, and so in our more recent work, we, we think this is actually an opportunity to start to design and develop what I'm calling kind of culturally aware or culturally sensitive technologies. Right? So instead of just translating English because it's the biggest and populating it in all the other languages, we want to develop technologies that actually highlight some of these distinctions and differences. Um, so that's the third part of the last part of the talk, and this will be relatively quick. I'm just going to demo uh, a system that we built called Omnipedia. So the challenge, again, is that we have siloed information due to these language barriers. But there's an opportunity here. We have a huge repository of new information or diverse information that a speaker of a single language might not have access to. Okay, so for this, we wanted to develop a system to help deal with this. And we think about this as um, Omnipedia uh, was what we, we have designed. So it gives access to around 8 million plus articles uh, across 25 language editions. And it highlights, the goal was to highlight both the similarities and the differences that occur across these different language editions. So this is Omnipedia. Well, this is a blank screen of Omnipedia. That's how you start. Um, I'm going to give an example. We put in conspiracy theory uh, as the topic that we want to look at. Uh, and then once we put that in, we populate the languages we want to do. Here we're going to do all 25 languages. Uh, and then we get our results back. And it's a visual, an interactive visualization system that you can use. Um, and what you see here is each color represents topics from a particular language edition. So these are each of these dots basically represents a unique topic that was only mentioned in that language. So this is all the unique topics on the conspiracy theory page mentioned in English. Uh, this is German, this is Spanish. And by looking at this, you can also get kind of a distribution um, of where there's sort of more unique information across languages. And we can do things like uh, when you actually scroll over any of these dots, you can see what it is that's, that's being talked about. So in the Chinese Wikipedia, the progress of the SARS outbreak is mentioned on the conspiracy theory page, but not in any other languages. Uh, in the Hebrew Wikipedia, Fatah is mentioned. Um, also, one of my favorites, Microsoft <laughs> Windows. <laughs> so in the Hebrew Wikipedia, Microsoft Windows is mentioned as something on the conspiracy theory page. And you might wonder, well, if you can't read Hebrew, you wouldn't know this. But what we do is you actually click on it. We do a little bit of translation here. It's the one place where we have to do some, some translation. So we do snippet extraction. We're going to pull out the context around it and do translation. And if you read this, it says something to the effect of, I'm going to embellish a little bit, um, the US government is in cahoots with uh, Bill Gates, and when they developed the Windows operating system, they put some latent code into the OS that whenever the US goes to war with anybody in the Middle East, uh, the leader of the US calls up Bill Gates, they flip a switch, and all the systems crash. <laughs> so that's basically what they're, they're talking about there. And the real joke here, which I can't take credit for, um, Wendy Kellogg was the one who was clever enough to say this, is uh, the real joke is it actually requires flipping a switch to make Windows crash. <laughs> so we can also see uh, topics that are mentioned in, in two languages, in three languages, and so on and so forth. Before I take you all the way over, what are, what are global conspiracy theories? What are we going to see? What do you think we're going to see? Things that are mentioned on all 25 language editions in conspiracy theory. Landing on the moon. Moon landing. It's a good guess. Yep. Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin? <laughs> <laughs> Others? 
Aliens <laughs> build pyramids. Aliens build pyramids. The aliens building pyramids. That one's not quite global, but it's close. Yeah. Uh, end of the world in 2012. End of the world in 2012. Uh, yes, I believe that one did show up. World Trade okay. Towers. Yep. September 11th. Right. So we see a number of things. Moon landing conspiracy theories. JFK assassination. That's a big one. September 11th. Uh, Freemasonry. Right. Is another one that has a lot. So here we can actually see the things that are being represented on a lot of language editions. So this is like perhaps at least these topics are being talked about on the conspiracy theory page. So the visualization system allows us to see that. But again, like we did with our sub-concept diversity, um, we don't necessarily want to say that they're being mentioned or talked about in the same way. So if you click on each of these nodes, we actually get the, ex the ex excerpts from each language, and they're sort of put up next to each other. So you can sort of read and kind of compare them. So you could see if you know, one particular thing was being talked about in a slightly different way in one language or another. Right? So it gives you a way to sort of browse and investigate when similar topics are covered, how they're sort of written about and the contextual components of that, of that writing. Okay? We do a number of other things with Omnipedia. You can actually go in and um, put in language sets. So linguists are very excited about this. You can put in Scandinavian languages and compare kind of the dis differences and distinctions. You can compare, you know, whatever basically sets you want to do. Um, sort of top 10 economies, bottom five economies, NATO languages, so on and so forth. There are different ways to kind of group these and turn things on and off. Um, we also, one of the really nice things about working with the interlanguage link graph is we get translation at the article topic level for free. So it's super fast to switch our interface from, for instance, English into Spanish. Um, so you can do all of your sort of browsing from Spanish or from Hebrew or whatever language it is you want. Uh, and that comes for free and, and really quickly. Um, so I don't have time to talk about the studies of Omnipedia. We've done a number of them. Um, I'm going to kind of summarize some of what we found. Uh, we discovered a lot of the um, studies and the participants discovered that uh, the, there's unique information uh, for single language editions than the great amount of it. Uh, and they produce a, number, a larger number of what we call novel and deeper insights. So we have some insight studies where people are sort of, oh, that's new, I didn't know that, right? So where you have a, have a new insight. And we can actually show that by using this, they, they do a better job than if they're trying to work with uh, kind of other competing systems. Um, they do a lot of investigating of stereotypes, kind of an interesting thing for people to do. Um, journalists were really interested in it for doing this comparison of different representations. They liken it to sort of taking a bunch of history books and stacking them on each other and then looking to see how they take common events or wars and things like that and describe them and discuss them in different ways. Um, they identify a lot of the global aspects of a concept. Uh, and quite honestly, a lot of people are just shocked at the amount of content that wasn't available to them in, for instance, the English Wikipedia. So they're, they're sort of taken aback by the great amount of, of new data that they have access to. Um, as researchers, we also wanted to provide a few tools for, for the general community to use. Um, our first pass at this was called Wikipedia, uh, lesson to be learned here. We thought we were super clever by embedding the API in the Wikipedia thing. <laughs> Google doesn't think we're so clever and autocorrects it to Wikipedia, so you can never find it. <laughs> the new version is called Wikibrain, right? So you can go there and get that. Um, so Wikibrain is great. It's a project that my former graduate student, uh, Brent Hecht, uh, who's at the University of Minnesota now, has been developing along with uh, Shalad Sen at, at McAllister, and some of my lab is still working on this. Um, it supports all the current Wikipedia language editions. There's tools there that allow you to sort of download and organize the different Wikipedia data sets and load them automatically into, data, into databases. Um, we do the automatic alignment and identification of uh, multilingual concepts. We have the semantic relatedness algorithms in there. So if you wanted to say, for instance, what's the relationship between two entities, race, car, and engine, and you wanted to look at those different correlation or those different uh, relatedness uh, metrics across languages, you could get that. And so if you're interested in particular topics and how they relate and how they're represented, you could use this uh, as a tool to do it. It also supports single machine parallelization. Um, so we can do things like multi-threading and have multi-threading support. Um, one small caveat, though, uh, the full English is around 4 million articles. It requires about 200 gigs uh, of space and takes about six hours of processing uh, on an eight-core server. So um, it will take a little bit of time. So if you just want to tinker with it, get this, the um, one of the smaller languages, or, or use this what's called the Simple English Wikipedia, which is a very small version of, of English that you can use to kind of try out. So with that, I really want to thank, obviously, a couple of my graduate students that did a ton of work on this project. So Brett Hecht, as I mentioned, who's at Minnesota now, and Patty Bob, who's at Google. Uh, here's some of the papers that have um, many more details about the stuff that I presented on. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take questions.
on a system so quickly as this one, this particular one. Um, but I also want to go back through the articles and say, do I believe the analyses you're doing? Mm -hmm. right? Because you went fast. Um, but the very first one about the link structure, who made those links? Yeah, so it's, it's community. It's user-generated content. Um, it's a pretty active community that, that does it. Um, it tends to be multilingual speakers. Uh, that tend to produce them. Uh, and there's been a lot of studies. The thing about the hyperlingual approach is it actually allows you to validate some of those, those links. So when you get a spurious link, like one that maybe shouldn't exist, that's also when we spiral out of control when we, when we build the concept. Uh, and so there's, I think we have kind of reasonable ways of, of, of getting those situated. Now, what I didn't present on is we've done a lot of validation studies as well too. So for instance, we generate all of those links. We have the missing links and we have bilingual speakers. Um, we did one with English-Spanish pairing, one with French and German pairing, and one with German and Japanese uh, to do validation studies on those. And we see pretty similar results, around 5% of missing links and, and almost close to 0% of links that shouldn't be there that were actually in there. Yeah, terrific. Questions? Oh. Very interesting talk. So I have a question about the single concept and the conclusion of global and diversity. Uh -huh. So I, I wonder how much of that is just due to the uh, Wikipedia culture that's actually created by the instructions that people are given to create a Wikipedia page that's notable. Mm -hmm. if, if the instructions had been different, let's say create a Wikipedia page that has uh, societal significance, mm -hmm. people might have done very different things. So um, creating a page that's notable, someone can put their favorite local garage band on Wikipedia. And that, of course, might exist in the English Wikipedia and not in the French, right? Yeah. It's, it's, so it's kind of creating a bias toward doing something that's local and individual as opposed to maybe something more objective. And, yeah. Um, so. yeah, I mean, you could certainly, Imagine what if those same instructions said, you know, put in whatever would make this more comprehensive, <laughs> right? In which case there wouldn't be that judgment. But, um, and I think it's, I think it certainly is a fair point. I think one of the reasons we're getting this unique information is because it's considered to be notable to an individual. But remember, it's not just an individual because a lot of this stuff gets deleted and reverted. It's a community. So it's a community of these language speakers um, that have to sort of retain that piece of information or, or kill it. And when we look at the statistics on, proposing new pages in sort of English or German or uh, Hebrew. Actually, um, English is pretty bad. You try to put something new on English, it's pretty hard to get up over the hump of the community determining that it's a notable contribution, right? And so if it's too regional, it won't actually go through. And uh, Hebrew is even more strict. It's actually even harder sometimes to get new articles uh, up there. So I think that's kind of pushing in the in the other direction, actually, from the, from the notability. But it's, I think it's a, it's a fair point. I mean, there's, there's something about this, but I, what I would say is that while well, the things that are persisting are notable to this language community, right? And that may be many more things that are spatially local. Yeah. So Diego and Wattenberg did this work on history of flow diagrams of Wikipedia, and among other things, they showed you know sort of spectacular examples of things like edit wars in, in the chocolate entry actually. Yep. <laughs> Have you looked at uh, what kind of content is most churning in these edit wars? Is it really particular content, or is it stuff that's more linked to other concepts? Yeah, we haven't we haven't really done that. So so it's been enough of a computational task for us to try to do these snapshots. Some of the stuff we're trying to do has more of this sort of like this temporal components or sort of adding and removing kinds of things. Uh, and I think that would be really fascinating to look at, but it's not anything we've been able to sort of at least at the scale that we're trying to do, where we're actually looking at everything, um, is not something we've been, been able to address yet. Um, so I don't have a good, necessarily, answer for that. But um, I mean, one of the things that I found pretty compelling about this, at least for me, is that I'm used to doing samples, um, where you have to sort of, you know, you get a point estimate and you have variance, and you can say with a certain amount of, you know, uh, confidence whether or not you're seeing something. But here we're actually, we're measuring everything. So I mean, our mean is what it is. It's our mean. And, 
Um, and that's kind of an, an interesting space to be in. But we've struggled when we wanted to ask more of these, some of these other questions about how to do that. We've been working um, in recent projects that we don't have published yet, but where we're looking at um, temporal slices and the, the influence to see if there's basically sort of influence patterns that are happening from one language to another. So maybe, maybe English starts to grow a certain category and topic area, and then that influences something else in German, and then we can see that kind of temporally as we're unfolding. But most of what we've seen so far is just kind of the patterns we're seeing sort of stably. Everything is growing, but the relative rates are basically staying pretty similar uh, over time. Right, one last question here. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, so when you're talking about single language concepts, it occurs to me that something that's local um, is likely to have less particular information about it, whereas a concept that is globally relevant is probably a lot more, um, has a lot more content to it. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, is, did you see any correlation where, say, the, the, the concepts that cut across languages are larger articles, whether that's measured by out degree or just number of words on the page, anything like that? Yeah, so, so we do, we have a, it's in a thesis, but it's not published. Um, but uh, network analysis, basically, of looking at this. And, and what we see is, so basically the way we uh, set that up was core periphery network structure based on kind of link structures, right. which yeah. gets to sort of similar things. And, and um, there's a little bit more weight on the multi, the, the, the global concepts that are more core concepts, but it's not very extreme. It's just a little bit different. Yeah, so which basically says there's still, in these peripheral concepts, um, at least for each language edition, there's still an awful lot that's kind of happening out there. Yeah. Let's uh, thank Darren again.